And we welcome you, know, you to, to my issue forum so just so entitled yeah, Walking yeah. While Black. Love is the answer. You know, I hate that we even have to be going through this today. But yet and still the issues between police and our communities seem to fill the newspapers and reports on various websites and certainly the evening news. The purpose of this forum is to examine the causes of the mistrust between communities and police and to discuss what we can do to rebuild these broken relationships. Ladies and gentlemen, I have stopped by here to remind you that we must be about the business of rebuilding these relationships. Because the community need the police. Thank you. And guess what? The police need the community. As a lawyer who practiced for more than 20 years, I can tell you that there are very few crimes that are solved without the cooperation of the public. And police will tell you that there are a few bad apples. I am convinced that there are more than a few. I want to believe that there were a few, but just here recently in Baltimore, we had several officers indicted for planning evidence. How do you gain trust when you have officers planning evidence and people being fearful that may, they may be the victim of that. On the other hand, we are all very upset, I know I am, <coughs> when any officer is harmed. People act like you cannot be concerned about black lives mattering, and they act like because you are concerned about black lives mattering, that you then have some hatred for the police, or you don't sympathize. Many of us have police in our families. Come on now. Many of us have had great relationships with the police. Can you tell but one thing is for sure, up there, second panel. that if we start talking past each other, we will never, ever be able to solve the problems that we experience today. Am I right? Come on now. Mm -hmm. And so, in order to frame our panel discussion, we will have a, a viewing of the extraordinary documentary <coughs> entitled Walking While Black Love is the Answer. I want to thank Mr. A.J. Ali, who you will meet in a few minutes, for creating this very important how you feeling? And very outstanding film we are about to watch. But also for joining us here today. I saw also want to thank our entire panel, who will be introduced to you shortly for participating in, in our discussion. You plan on doing any type of work? And to Brother Anquan Bolden. I thank you for not only being the great sportsman that you are, but I also thank you for constantly reaching out into the community to make a difference. Understanding that you want to make a difference so that generations yet unborn will not have to fight the same fights. I know that you lost a loved one to a police encounter. I want to thank you for not only 
for being willing to share your story, but also for using your pain for the greater purpose of healing communities. As you know, I lost my nephew six years ago, gunned down, a senior at Old Dominion College in, Nor in Norfolk. Innocent young man just trying to be the best that he could be, gunned down. Five o'clock in the morning, robbery. And so we have a lot of things we got to deal with, but today we're dealing with police and the community. We're here today to discuss ways to build greater trust between police and minority communities. We cannot afford to wait another day to have this conversation. We cannot wait for another headline. To break about another police-related killing of an unarmed African-American. Right now, protests are taking place in St. Louis, Missouri. After the acquittal of a white policeman who shot a 24-year-old black man to death. As you all know, my own hometown of Baltimore is one of many, many communities across the nation that is now working to repair the fractured relationship between police and communities. And so, it was nearly two and a half years ago after Freddie Gray was killed in police custody that scenes of my city in upheaval dominated the screens across not only the nation but the world. Sadly, those scenes from Baltimore are not the only horrific images branded in my mind. There's the image of the young man in Ferguson lying dead in the street. Somebody's son, somebody's brother, somebody's cousin, leaving a family mourning for what could have been. And there's the image of an unarmed man from Staten Island, New York, being dropped to the sidewalk in a chokehold. There's the image of a man outside of St. Paul, Minnesota, bleeding to death in his car with his girlfriend and her four-year-old daughter sitting right next to him. And all of us have seen it over and over and over and over again. And these bring up the images from what I see on my own block. See, I live on, in the inner city. I live on Madison and North, for those of you from Baltimore. Been there for 35 years. I see a young man, African-American man, stopped, frisked, told a strip simply because he was standing on a street corner trying to catch the bus with his girlfriend. Come on now. What do you think goes through his head? How does he become suddenly the person who trusts the police when he's been humiliated in front of his girlfriend, told to strip down in front of her? And what does she think? One of the things that I found so interesting, Trudy, is that after the the services in Baltimore, we, I went to Busboys and Poets to hear a discussion about what was happening in Ferguson. And one of the interesting things that I noticed is that most of the people that were protesting were women. Knowing and worrying that their sons might become a victim. And so, out of our pain must come our passion to do our purpose. 
It is not enough to simply say it's bad. We have to spend a lot of time coming up with the solution. And that's why I'm so pleased that we have the panel that we have with us today. And so, without further ado, we're going to watch this film. I want you to watch it very carefully. Uh, it is well put together. And so we cannot work through all of these issues today. No, we're not going to work through all of them. But we can start by understanding each other's points of view, by discussing what is working well, and by having some productive and healing conversations. Working through this together is, is really the only way we can get to a solution. We're all here with one goal in mind, to ensure our families, our officers, and our communities to make sure they're all safe. Again, I appreciate everyone's attendance, and now we will watch the film. Let me introduce the producer, uh, Mr. A.J. Ali, the creator of Walking Wild Black, Love is the Answer, and following the viewing of the film, A.J. will uh, serve as a moderator for panel discussion, and I hope that you all will, as you watch the film, jot down questions that you may want to ask of our panelists, and we do indeed have an excellent group of panelists. And so, A.J., I want to thank you for all that you do and all that you've done but more importantly, what you are going to do. Thank you. Let's give another round of applause for Congressman Elijah Cummings. I love this man because he's inspiring, he has a heart as big as this capital, and he is here for all of you. I have met very few men in my life who cares as much about what he does and who he serves. Thank you so much. I'm gonna be very brief. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I'm gonna be very brief. But I want to just share one thing. Um, and before I do that, my sister Inga Lynch, thank you so much. Stand, raise, raise your hand or stand up or something. She she's was instrumental in helping to get this film made. When, when, you get, when you get profiled and no one wants to listen but your family, family, you know, you, you, know, you, know, you know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Yeah, so I just want to shout out to her. So I want to share one quick thing. Um, there's an officer, Richard Reynolds, in the, in, the, in the room here. And he's with the Montgomery County Police Department. And uh, he just shared something with me. Now, he and I met recently uh, through a friend, Marquise Evans, who's a sponsor of ours. Uh, but what he just shared with me brought tears to my eyes because uh, he asked me about my mom, Shirley, who went through a cancer battle years ago. And who was it that took care of my mom but his mom at Howard County General Hospital. And so, you know, back to family. We don't know how we're connected. We don't know who's gonna be taking care of your mom. Stand up, please, officer. We wanna thank you for what you do. And thank your mom. <laughs> so look, um, we're going to have a, a little three-minute clip to play before our film. And the reason why we're going to do it beforehand is because the gentleman who's responsible for that clip uh, has to, to leave early uh, because of another commitment in New York. Uh, so we're going to play that clip, and then I'm going to uh, introduce him, and then we'll get on to the film. Thank you again for coming. Do 
you have a child that's really rough? Do you have a child that you're ready to throw the towel in? Do you have a child that you have no idea how to turn them around? You're just kind of giving up on? Here's what I'm gonna ask you to do. Find me, reach out for me, I'm not hard to find. My name is Melvin Russell, I'm the chief Community, find me. Reach out for me. I'm not hard to find. My name is Melvin Russell. I'm the Chief of Community Collaboration Division for Baltimore Police Department. My team and I, we specialize in taking what some people call the worst of the worst, the children that we want to give up on. We specialize in taking those children, taking them away, far away, so they can't run back home, taking them away from a concrete jungle, put them into a civilian uh, type of jungle where we're surrounded by trees, we're surrounded by crickets, darkness in the night, but here's the thing that we do. We transform their lives. We take the crap out of them and we pour love into them. And by the time you get them back, you won't recognize your child. They'll be respectful, they'll be mindful, they'll stay in school, they'll get good grades, and you'll be saying, what happened? I'm gonna tell you what happened. The Love You To Life summer camp got a hold of them and all those counselors and we pour love into them like you do not understand and you'll get an incredible child back. I beg you, send them my way before you discard them. We'll take care of them for you. I am somebody. I am love. I am a leader. I am a leader. I am a leader. I am a leader. We knew that basically with a little love, of a little nurturing, that they can get to the next level and be successful in society. The biggest part is Towards the end, what we'll have is a big reveal. Um, we'll all be dressed like this, um, but I'll have those that have a profession of office. They'll be off to the side in full uniform. So as I call them out one by one, they'll come out in uniform and you'll see the, you'll see the shock value. You'll see the surprise in a lot of these kids if they haven't started figuring it out already. Senior Counselor Jeffrey Featherstone, where you at? We gotta introduce one more. Please put your hands together for Director Mel. I had no idea who these people were. They was just all, they all told me they was counselors. And last night, they revealed themselves that they are. Most of them, nine times out of ten, they was police officers. Thank y'all for helping our youth, supporting us as parents, and I really appreciate this program. Counselors who turn out to be police officers, police officers who turn out to be family. Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to introduce you to Chief Melvin Russell of the Baltimore City Police Department. God bless you. I want to take in as much of this form as I possibly can, so I'm going to be quick. You know, I'm coming up on 38 years and just what, baby? About two weeks, I'm saying baby. 
That's my wife, I can say baby. <laughs> in about two weeks, 38 years in this department. And you know, I was raised in an apartment where we felt and we saw things way different than we do today. There was real community relationships. There was relational equity between the police and the community. Matter of fact, there was relational equity between all of us. Everybody lived in a village. Does that make sense? And I don't see that today. I don't see the type of police that I grew up being taught to be. And so I've self-inflicted myself as I rose to a certain level and had a certain amount of little bit of authority. I rose to a certain level and said, you know what? I'm going to start taking some actions. And I took my small little band of police officers who have a heart to serve and said, we're going to self, I told them, we're going to self-inflict ourselves. We're going to self-inflict ourselves to take care of our community and show them how to love one another because we've forgotten how to love one another. We want to not just love on our communities, but also everything that made up our community. So even our returning citizens. So we, I think we have the most phenomenal reentry movement in the country where we love on our returning citizens. And by the time we finish loving them, they all are gainfully employed. All are gainfully employed. Even the felons, even the felons. And so even with the justice system, we have judges. We have a whole lot of people we work with. Um, but even those kids, we started that last year, that camp last year, and I said, the kids were rough last year, but I want really rough kids. I want the ones that aren't going to school, absentee. I, I want the kids that are bullied, cyberbullying, beaten up. I want kids who are trying to shoot each other and deal and draw. I want the worst of the worst. And I don't know why my officers did this or how they did it, but you know, they, they, they scoured Baltimore City and found a bunch of pits, lifted up the pits, looked under the pits, and saw some Children demon chained up in the pits, unchained them, and then brought them to that camp. I got more than I asked for. I got, I got more than I asked for. What you see there are some smiling faces. But they came in cussing, fighting, and not just each other, but the counselors who were the popo, y'all. Come on now. But we couldn't tell them, hey, man, you pushing the police. But we couldn't even tell them that. But by the end of that, those 50 kids, every last one of them broke. And every last one of them lives were transformed. And so I'm not going to belabor this, but just know those kids, we, we're with them every month because we, don't, it's, we can't just have an event. One of the things that we realize is anybody that you become connected to, family, AJ talked about family, family always looks for consistency. That's how you become family. So we're consistent in these young kids' lives. So I'm not here to talk about a whole lot, but I really want to just honor, first and foremost, um, Congressman Cummings, he is a champion for this nation a champion for this nation. He really is on many, many fronts. On many fronts. And, and whether he likes it or not, I, I consider him as a, a mentor to me, and I just thank God because if it wasn't for him, someone who looks like me couldn't even gotten to the place that I am today. And I'm grateful for all the hard work that he has done. And he continues to do. And then my brother AJ, for putting together this film, because I can tell you AJ could not stand the police. He was one of those that hated the police. And I cut him off for about what, AJ? About two years, three years? I wouldn't even talk to him because he was just talking about how much he hate the police. I'm like, bro, I'm a police. Why do you keep talking about you hate the police? But when he finally simmered down a little bit, and maybe he'll tell some of you that later, we began to talk, and he talked about this wonderful vision he had. And I said, AJ, please, I'd like to be a part of that. So I'm just going to say this. You're about to see this film, Walking While Black. We've all experienced it. Listen, I've experienced it over and over being profiled while I'm in the uniform driving a police car. Tickets in driving a police car by white police who profile me over and over again just because. So I understand this. My wife and I, baby, stand up real quick, real quick. I got to turn this over. Stand up because she's so beautiful. I just like to show her off. Lolita, yeah. We've got a beautiful blended family of eight kids. Six of them are African-American boys. She wanted nine, but I said eight's enough, enough of that. But listen, eight kids and those boys to this day still experience walking and driving while black. Walking and driving while black. And, and, and I'm not going to go into that because we've got to push forward. So this work is very, very, very important. And if you don't get anything out of this film, I need each and every one of you to search deep within your heart after you see this film and figure out, run to AJ. And I apologize in advance because I can't stay. I apologize in advance, but I have two of my staff members, Quinise. Q, are you in the room? Q, you in the room? No, they're probably outside. And Lynn, you can see them at the table. Oh, Lynn. Lynn is there. You can see her. They can answer any questions. 
But I promise you this, or here's what I need you to do. Find out how to get involved with the love is the answer movement. Find out how to get in love. Because if we ain't got love in this country, and what I'm seeing right now, Lord Jesus, we got more hatred than love, y'all. At least the darkness seems like it's eclipsing the love that we have. We got a lot of work to do. And I don't know about you, but I believe love can overcome every single thing. Everything. So here's the movie. I'm in love with the movie. I'm in love with the movement. So please sit back and enjoy. How many of you never seen it before? Oh, Jesus, we're going to have a good time. We're we going to have a good time. All right. All right. All right. So look, look, look. Tell your neighbors, tell your friends, tell everybody, tell everybody. Everybody. That's right. Look at somebody say, tell everybody. To tell somebody. You need to go see Walking Wild Black. Love is the answer. Get involved with this movement because love is the answer. Come on, Earl. Earl, you want to play that? Let's go. What are you looking at? What's in your pocket? Hey, don't look at me like that. Hey, hold on. Come here. All of that over and over played out on streets, cities large and small, day in and day out for generation. Black and brown kids being pushed up against the wall. You want to go to the root of some of the police relation issues? Lack of trust? It's serious stuff. We have a chance to end that. The Dyna police officer confronts an African-American man walking down the street, and things got a little bit physical. Over here. What? You're walking down the middle I'm of the street. I'm over here, white You're being a No, I'm not. What? You can't just put your hands You're on me like this. This is Charles Kinsey laying in the middle of the road with his hands in the air. He's a therapist just trying to help a confused autistic man who ran away from a group home. I'm minding my business, officer. I did not do anything. Please just leave me alone. I'm tired of it. This stops the day. Okay, so can you put your hand off me? Well, he's got his hands up there for now. This guy's still walking. Get out of the car. I'm getting out. Let me get out. Get out of the car. And then you I will stop. light you up. Get out. Wow. Now. Wow. Get out of the car. Are you kidding me? This is some bull. Don't touch him, please. The girl came over. Don't touch me. Give us a bag of baby shit. Get out of the car. just got shot and I'm standing there some like, sir why did you shoot me and his ex in his words to me he said I don't know Ray asked for medical help more than once while being transported in a van in fact Ray's autopsy revealed his spinal injury was the only trauma to his body our children get killed in some of the most unbelievable ways and when little black and brown boys get killed it's almost a cliche no Ladies and gentlemen, please give A.J. Ali another hand. It's a great film. Before we go forward with the panel discussion, you know, as I was watching the film, I could not help but think about um, when we had the disturbances in Baltimore. And the disturbances happened in my neighborhood two blocks from where I live and I'll never forget that night going over there night after night and meeting with the trying to 
prevent any kind of violent activity between the police and my neighbors. And a lot of the people who were out there protesting were people that I'd known since they were little babies. And so here I am watching CNN and I look at the screen again and I said to my, I said, Pookie, is that you? <laughs> Ray Ray, is that you, man? I'm talking to the television, right? So I got up and went out and began to talk to them and got the ring leader. And I said, you know, because I knew that he had a lot of his boys there. And he said, he said, Mr. Cummins, you know, I respect you, man, but you know, man, you know, like, you know, we just gonna have to get, we just gonna go down tonight. We're gonna get arrested. What the, I don't give up. And so um, I said, I thought you had two children. He said, yeah. I said, I thought your, your lady, she works down at the University of Maryland at night, right? I said, yeah. I said, well, who's going to take care of the babies tonight? He said, I am. I'm supposed to. I said, you just said you're going to be in jail. And then, you know, he kept, you know, just being all upset and everything. And then he put his, then I put my arms around him. And I said to him these words. I don't want nothing to happen to you, bro. I love you. And I respect you. And he backed off, and the tears began to run down his face. He said, I, he said, I thought he was going to hit me. He said, man, you the first brother that ever in my life said that they loved me. And when I, look, when I thought about the film that we just watched, Ali, and then that love is the answer, that love and that respect is the answer. And so, again, we want to open up the dialogue. Um, we're going to go for a little while longer. Come on up, man. And um, again, I want to thank all of you for being here. I also want to introduce, you know, I have a youth program, the Elijah Cummings Youth Program, uh, based in Baltimore. We've done it for 20 years, uh, working with young people, helping to mold their lives, uh, we have a 100% graduation from high school rate. And a 99% graduation from college rate. Why don't you all stand up? <laughs> I am, I am, I often say to them, I often say to them that I am so glad that I can be a part of their destiny. But I also tell them something else, parents. I tell them that I'm so glad that they are a part of mine. Because, because, because part of my joy comes from seeing young people rise up to be all that God meant for them to be. And I don't want them to be gunned down. I don't want them to be in a situation where they're constantly going to funerals. I don't want it to become normal for them to have to deal with death after death. People shot down and shot down in a way that's just inhumane and unfair and not right. And so, what's up, Judy? Sorry, I feel like the, the pastor. So. <laughs> Too bad I can't read her writing. <laughs> Firefighter students, African American firefighter students. Why don't you all stand? African American firefighter students. Hey, hey, all right now. Good to have you all. She, even, she, I guess she wanted, she wanted to be, you know how women are, they try to be all proper and proper, appropriate. She read, wrote it in red, firefighter, you got it. <laughs> Amen. I'm the son of two preachers, so y'all, excuse me. Ladies and gentlemen, again, Miss uh, Ali, A.J. Ali.
and, and I want to also thank all of our, our panelists who are going to be introduced now. All right. Give it up one more time for Congressman Cummings. He's amazing. <laughs> So right before I introduce the panelists, and I can't wait to introduce the panelists, I want to just recognize uh, a few people. Um, just please stand up if you're here. The, the folks from Spoke Hub, one of our new partners, uh, Rand Corporation, if you're, if you're here. Uh, Trey Carlisle and his, and his family uh, came from California. Trey was 17 when we filmed him. Now he's 18. He's a filmmaker. He's a student. They, they came from LA just for the screening. Um, I want to thank Wanda Watts for all the hard work that she's doing on our team. Pia Civiletti, who has been with me since day one. I don't know why, but she's stayed. Um, Dan Brown Jr., who couldn't make it here, but he did all the incredible music for this film. And he donated it. Yeah. And, and he's a white dude with, filled with soul who came from a racist family, and his heart did not vibe with theirs, and he wound up contributing $30,000 worth of music to this film to help bring people together. I want to recognize Maryland Senator Will Smith. Senator, you can please stand. Thank you so much for coming out. And uh, Jerome Stevens from Senator Ben Cardin's office is here as well. And uh, there we go, right back in the back there. Thank you. Senator Cardin has been, oh, and. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. All right. So here we go. I'm going to bring up our, our panel, and I feel like I should have some music or something playing for this. Um, I'm just going to go down the list here. I don't know where they're, they're, they're seated, but you can find your name tag. So this is, this is a great honor for me because this guy played for my favorite football team. Three-time pro bowler. Super Bowl champion. I'm not even going to mention the other teams. I'm just going to say Baltimore Ravens and Quan Bolden. I feel like I should have a ball to throw it at you or something. Now, don't ever let anyone tell you to just stick to what you know. Because this man retired from the NFL to make it his job to do social justice and to stick up for all of y'all, all right? So, especially students, when you're going on to do great things in life, don't ever let anybody tell you you can't do something, all right? Yeah. Errol Weber. Errol, come on up. Errol is my producer partner, y'all. He's the director of photography for this film. He's a creative director for this film. Errol's the guy when no one else would pick up a camera, you know, he's the guy who said, you know what, let's get to work. After three and a half years of development, couldn't find anybody to pick up a camera unless they got 20 grand. Errol said, we'll worry about the money later. Let's make a film. Yeah. <laughs> I want to introduce to you Bobby Kimbrough, retired special agent for the DOJ. Bobby drove up from North Carolina to be here, and he's, he's an amazing guy. Chief Melvin Russell had to, to depart, so in his place, Lynn Twyman, who heads up the youth and reentry uh, program for Melvin's office, we're so honored to have her. She's a dynamo doing amazing things. Neil Franklin is the director of Law Enforcement Action Partnership, LEAP, based here in Washington, D.C., and they're doing great work all over the country. This is a group of uh, police uh, law enforcement officials who have stepped up to say, you know what, we're not gonna, we're not gonna accept, accept status quo. We're gonna change things and make things better. They're putting that love into action every day. And Dr. Philip Atiba Goff, president for the Center of Policing equity. Any nerds in the house? <laughs> Represent. 
All right. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm just going to throw a question uh, out to the panel, and we're just going to go right on down the line, okay? And then we're going to, uh, after about 15 minutes or so, we're going to open up for questions. So we do have a microphone in the middle, so when we get to that part, just line up behind there, please. So let's start. Uh, ladies first. Um, I just want all of the panelists really to say we're talking about love as action steps. Learn about your community and the people in it. Open your heart to their needs. Volunteer yourself to be part of the solution and empower others to do the same. What does love mean to you and how can it be applied to repair, improve uh, police community relations in this country? Okay, great. Can everybody hear me? Yes. All right, good afternoon. Again, my name is Lynn Twyman. I'm the Youth and Reentry Program Administrator for the Baltimore Police Department. When we talk about love, for me, it means starting with ourselves first. Um, a lot of the trauma that we experience in our communities is as a result of unaddressed trauma that we as individuals have incurred, um, starting mo for most of us in the home, okay, from infancy on up. Um, and I can speak personally to this because I am a survivor of domestic violence um, growing up. And um, I've experienced homelessness growing up as well. And so I've seen a lot of dynamics. And whether it's in this work or working with the police department or in the community providing domestic violence prevention education, I always tell people in order to advance and in order to serve your community, you have to start with a love of self first. It always starts with me, myself, and I. Anquan. Uh, <laughs> uh, I, I would say for me, um, actually love is, is stepping outside of yourself um, and, and seeing somebody else's life from their point of view. Um, I think that the thing that we're, we're we've been missing as a, as a country. You know, we talk about love, but I think it's um, important for us to understand the kind of love we're talking about, we can't do absent God. And that's first and foremost. Um, in order for me to love the next person, um, I have to be willing to serve that person. I have to be willing to step outside of the way that I see things and step into their shoes. I'm. I've been married um, eight years now. Um, and for anybody who has been married or is married, you understand the difficulties that come with being married. I mean, just being honest, you're learning another person. You're have, having to deal with another person, dealing with their flaws, their attitudes, whatever comes with it. But in order for you to love that person, you have to step outside of yourself. You have to be willing to forgive a person even when they've done you wrong, um, even when you guys don't see eye to eye. And love is more than just talking about, you know, I love you. Love is more action than anything. I can tell my wife I love her, but she needs to honestly see that if and whenever she messes up. And that's the same thing that we have to do as people. <coughs> um, we have to see each other for who we are, good, bad, and different, whatever it is. But we have to be willing to walk with somebody in their shoes as well. And uh, I just want to reemphasize what he said about the marriage thing, because it really is a marriage between, well, well you know, whether it's husband and wife, I've been married 23 years, but between police and community. It's a marriage, right? And divorce is not an option. We have to figure out a way to make it work. You know? um, before we go further, I just want to recognize a couple other people. Amy Stratton is with the Congressman's Office, and she is amazing and has been just a, an incredible person to work with who put all this together. And Mark Adams back in the back there. Mark, please raise your hand. He's, our, he's one of our associate producers, and he's been doing sound and lighting. and. You know, there's just, you know, folks like them and, and Pia and Wanda, you know, you just can't do this kind of work without incredible people. Speaking of incredible people, Errol Weber, what does love mean to you, sir? For me, it's important for love to be put into action 
for you to express it. You can't just, uh, I know I'm echoing what Anquan said, but you can't just say you love someone. Uh, I, I do this all the time, and AJ is probably sick of me using this analogy, but uh, just, a sh uh, just shout out, uh, what is the opposite of love? Indifference. God, you just have to be the smart one, huh? So, <laughs> so the opposite of love is not hate. The opposite of love is indifference. Uh, indifference that comes in the form of complacency, uh, the failure to act. Um, indifference that comes in, um, in, in all kinds of different ways where a non-action can actually hurt people around you. And one of the things I want to stress with putting love into action is that even though when you go out into the community, you go out into the world to try to be a positive person, you may not see the effect of what you do to show love to them now. In the future, it will play a major role in their life and it will all come full circle. I have an example to tell you about. I wonder if Congressman Cummings is still in the room. He just left. He just left? Back in 2003, I was at Milford Mill Academy in Baltimore, and I was in their art program. And they had an art contest which was tied to a scholarship. And I won that contest with one of the paintings that I did. And part of that uh, award was I would uh, have my painting hung in uh, Congressman Cummings' office for a year, and I received a scholarship to go to art school. So I went to the Maryland Institute College of Art and studied film there for four years. Graduated in May of 2008 and immediately went to Zimbabwe for nine months to film a documentary about musicians with disabilities. A couple months later, that film won the Academy Award for Best Documentary Short. First film out of college wins an Oscar. The third film about the public and private education system, American Promise, won Sundance two years later. And now I'm 22 films in, and now I get to work with AJ Ali and Congressman Cummings on this amazing film about putting love into action in the community. So his investment that he made back in 2003 into my life, yeah, it took a while for him to see the result, but look at how it came full circle for him. Yeah, you never know what's going to happen when you build into someone's life, right? And uh, so that's important to remember. We might not uh, see some of the things that we do uh, turn into fruit, but in some cases we do, and it's great when it happens. And um, I want to recognize Lizette Ubidis right there, who's in our film and working with us. Going to be in our book, The Love is the Answer book, coming October 21st. So let's go on to Dr. Goff. So what love means to me, I can't help, I'm looking at the, the younger faces up in here, and I can't, can't help but thinking back to when I used to be, and, and don't worry, you're not necessarily seeing your future in front of you. Um, <laughs> um, but I'm thinking about what it felt like when I was around your age, and what it felt like when I started to think about love, and I thought, what's the first thing I did when I felt like I loved somebody? The first thing you do. No, not that thing. <laughs> The other thing, you pay attention. You pay attention, you notice. You're aware of what they're wearing day to day, who they're talking to, why they're not sitting next to you. I'm done clowning you, it's okay. Um, <clears throat> but you pay attention. And when I think about love and community, love and community is when we're paying attention. Let me tell you all what it doesn't look like. It doesn't look like being a civilized nation with all the money that we've got and having absolutely no idea how many people are shot by cops every year. That's not paying attention. Love does not look like having no sense of what the predictors are of racial disparities in our communities. That's not love. If you're paying attention, you measure. If you're paying attention, you have a sense, you have an intimacy of knowledge about what's going on there. I wanna give just one example because no one has ever said, I wanna hear more nerd when there's football players on the dais. That's never happened once in life. <laughs> um, but I give just one example of what it means to pay attention from a nerd perspective, okay? <clears throat> Cause I, I'm not just a professional nerd, I am also a nerd in my spare time. Um, <clears throat> So the Center for Policing Equity, we run the National Justice Database. It's the largest database of police behavior in the world. Okay, we're very proud of that fact. Um, and with that amount of paying attention, 
Here's one lesson I want to give to you that I gave to myself when I started paying attention to kids in school having contact with law enforcement. Now raise your hands if you ever knew one of them badass kids. Badass kid. Kid got in trouble right away. Raise your, go ahead. Don't lie. Raise your hand on up. Okay? And the one's not raising your hands, not paying attention, or don't want to admit that's your kid. That's okay. That's fine. I don't have to talk too much about you from up here. Um, I'm looking at a data set looking at kids on trajectory, looking at two years worth of data on those kids. And we got them badass kids, the kids who are doing dirt right up front before we even touch them, before they even get into high school. They got a couple of arrests. They're self-reporting that they're, they're doing drugs, they're involved in alcohol. Y'all know these kids. I'm predicting later on they're going to have the most contact with law enforcement. Of course. Of course they will. What if I told you, you start paying attention, you learn that's not true? It's not true. Say, someone told a lie one day. It's not how bad the kids were when they started. That doesn't predict how much contact they have with law enforcement. Here's what is predictive. The amount of contact you have with law enforcement predicts how much you're going to be in trouble later on. Contact with police can cause criminal behavior, and here's why. Anybody ever get hemmed up by the cops? Anybody ever get frisked, get tossed? <clears throat> Said, what are you doing? Why are you here? Okay, go ahead, go on. Knowing you didn't do nothing wrong, and you know they know you didn't do nothing wrong, and then the next day they come back around. If I'm gonna get tossed that way when I'm following the rules, why do I wanna follow the rules going forward? Getting hemmed up by the cops is part of what's causing delinquency in adolescent boys, black and Latino boys in particular. And if you paid attention, you would know that. That's how data and nerddom translates into love in terms of social justice and racial justice with regards to policing. Love starts with showing up and it ends by paying attention. Thank you. I, I want to recognize another nerd in the room as well, if you don't mind. Patrick Johnson, <laughs> open policing right there. He's doing some amazing things to give uh, police departments uh, feedback. Uh, and it's kind of like a Yelp for police community relations. So all the nerds need to talk afterwards. All right, so we can help solve this thing. Bobby Kimbrough, one of my favorite brothers. I can't tell you how many times he's made the six hour drive <coughs> up to this area to get together with us, just willing to do anything and everything to help improve things. Bobby, what's your, uh, what's your idea on love, my man? Well, when I think about love or personal love, or I think about sacrifice, I think about the greatest sacrifice that was given to mankind over 2,000 years ago. I think about truth when I think about love, because when you love somebody, you can be truthful to them. So when I think about love as it relates to policing and the community, the part of truth comes in because the problems that we're seeing every day has to deal with truth and the love, because I can't transform you until I become transparent with you. The moment I become transparent with you, I become vulnerable. That means that when the brother spoke about loving his wife, his wife has seen a side of him that none of us have ever seen. She's probably seen him cry. Some of us have probably never seen that. So when you talk about love, that's a powerful thing. What are you willing to do? You know, when you look at the rainbow, it'd be hard to pick out what color makes the rainbow so beautiful. It's all the colors blended. But the problem that we have here from my perspective, from where I've seen it, from visiting all 50 states and traveling all over the world, is that we've yet to address the truth. We've talked about it, but we've never went to the root of it. So until we really experience love to where we love one another, regardless of race, color, creed, or gender, and I can love you based on your differences, I can base, love you based on where you come from. And once we start to love one another in that true love, that true love, then we can get to the root of the problem. Thank you, Bobby. Uh, you know, you and, and, and Melvin and you know, some other folks that have worn the, the uniform have been just incredible inspirations to me. Uh, you've been through the same things that we've been through. 
and now you're you know spending your time trying to help make it better so we really appreciate that um, same holds true for the next uh, speaker Neil Franklin um, Neil uh, you guys do some really unique work very powerful work can you share how leap uh, spreads love Sure, AJ, and it, and it is a work, it is just that, it is a work of love, the, what we do and what we have dedicated ourselves to doing in um, trying to deal with this issue of police within our communities. And, you know, first of all, police shouldn't be within your communities, police should be of your community. We are your community, it should be one and the same, not something that we have to build a bridge between. And that's where we've lost uh, part of this fight. Um, one of the things that I definitely know for certain, um, and, and thank you, Brother Kimbrough, um, in, with that relationship with God, love has to be first and foremost unconditional. Unconditional. Not about what somebody does or what somebody doesn't do or what they give you or what they don't give you. First and foremost, it has to be unconditional no matter what that person is, is about, what they do, how they look. Unconditional love. From this, from this point, from this perspective where I am in, in law enforcement, where I gave 34 years of my life, more than half of my life, um, it has to be agape love. <coughs> Bobby, as you said, Sacrifice. You have to be willing to sacrifice yourself for the people that you serve within your communities. And if you can't deal with that, if you, if you can't handle that, then you need another job other than policing. It's, um, you have to be able to, to see people, and I mean really see people and acknowledge people and let them know that you see them and communicate with them in a way that they know that it is unconditional. Yeah, I may not be happy with what you do. That's something else. But first and foremost, as a human being, I love you. And you heard Melvin say that. Let me tell you, that's Melvin. That's Melvin Russell. That is his persona. Despite what you do or, or, or what you're about in his community, that brother loves you. And, and that's where we all should be coming from. That's a hard thing to do for a lot of the policing community. It's a, it's a hard thing to do for us peop, as people to do. Because people piss you off. They do. Family will piss you off. But you've got to be at a place with yourself where you can accept the brokenness and still love that person. and show up when they need you and be there when they need you, whether you want to be there or not. So I'm going to ask one more question, but before I do that, would you turn to your neighbor and say, I love you? I love you. I love you. I love you. <laughs> so uh oh, look at the audience. <laughs> I, 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 I see the young men in the front uh, row up here <laughs> kind of like you know it, yeah man yeah you know <laughs> this ain't that hard man you can you can say I love you it's all right so um, just, I just have one more question before we open it up to questions from, from all of you. Anquan, um, high-profile life in the NFL, and yet you decided to take a stand for something that you believed in. Um, how difficult was that decision? Do you have any regrets? What's, what's next uh, for you in, in this journey? Uh, the decision for me was difficult. Um, 
simply because I, I love the game of football. I mean, it's, it's something that I've done for practically my entire life. Um, it's something that I've dedicated my life towards. Um, I can remember being a young man um, telling my parents that I would one day make it to the NFL. And from that point on, my whole life was dedicated to getting to um, the NFL. So for me to, to walk away um, while, while I'm still able to play um, was a difficult decision. Do I still love the game of football? Yes. Do I still have a passion to play? Of course I do. Um, but I feel like for me, there's some things that are more important to me um, than football at this point in my life. Um, I, I've lost a cousin to, at the hands of a police officer. Um, <coughs> my cousin was playing in a band, um, coming home from a show that he did with his bandmates and broke down on the side of the road. And while he was on the phone with roadside assistance, he had a, a, a police officer pull up on him. Um, it was an undercover officer. He was in an unmarked vehicle. And my cousin was on the phone with roadside assistance and the officer pulls up, doesn't identify himself as an officer. He just looks like a, a normal person. And he asked my cousin, you know, is everything good? Do you need help? My cousin was like, you know, I'm fine. You know, I'm on the, side, on, on, on the phone with roadside assistance, so they'll help me out. Um, so he asked my cousin, really? My cousin was like, yeah, I'm fine. Really? Yeah, I'm on the phone with roadside assistance. They'll help me, so I'm good. And three gunshots go off. Wow. So for me, it, and that happened um, like two years ago. So for me, it's more than just seeing it on a TV screen. Um, it's actually living, living it. It's actually going through it right now. Um, this officer is still, he's on house arrest at this point. Um, he's still able to work a nine to five. He's still able to go get haircuts. He's still able to take his, his kids to school. So my family is still dealing with this. Um, this is not something that, you know, that is not relevant to me. I mean, you know, a lot of people say it hits close to home. Well, for me, it hit, it hit home. Um, so I just feel like, and then, you know, I was in training camp with Buffalo this year, and then the whole Charlottesville thing happened. And for me, I wasn't proud to be an American because that's not the America that I want to leave to my two sons, where people are being hated because of the color of their skin or because of the way that they choose to live their lives or because of the race that they, that they are. I mean, you can't help that. Um, so for me to, to walk away from football to try to help um, foster relationships, it was a difficult decision to walk away from football, but it's, it's something that I don't regret at all. And it's something that I'll continue to fight for until I'm dead and gone, so. All right. So, um, yeah, we're family in here, all of us. I'm gonna open it up to questions, and please ask questions. <laughs> and keep them uh, short, please. And um, we'll try to get in as many as we can. Because the same, um, and it goes back to what Dr. Goff was saying, the same negative interaction experienced by young people, whether it be at the hands of the teacher, at the hands of the administrator, at the hands of the media, brings about that same anger and anguish. So while I think love is the answer as a concept, is, is awesome. Love is the answer as a, as a uh, action step, needs to address more practically the sources of authority and power that are bringing about this anguish, not just police officers because of their attractability, because Thank you. Your question, sir? I don't have a question. I have a okay. uh, comment. Kim, please keep it short. Thank you. I saw okay. this uh, presentation about maybe two months ago over Baltimore at the Norse um, Policeman Convention. Mm -hmm. And Norse yeah. stands yeah. for National Guard Day. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> 
Let's see if we can get that on. <laughs> so I went to a convention, uh, North, which is a uh, national organization of retired state troopers. Yeah, that's the convention. Yeah, I, yeah, yeah, I, I remember, remember you, you man. Yeah. All right. So I saw this, and I walked out. Not because it was a bad presentation, it was just too filled with emotion. All right. So recently this week, I live here in DC, by the way, and I was, the mic is on, oh, this is good. Go. So yeah. I was walk, I was driving down Benning Road, and most folks know where Benning Road is, Benning Road and G Street, something like that. So I'm driving down Benning Road, and I look in my rear view mirror, just looking. And there was a police officer and a woman that were having some sort of conversation. So I just kept looking. And at the end of the conversation, there was an embrace. I'll leave it at that. All right. Amen. 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 So hello, hello, hello. Right, so you, it, looks like, it looks like it is on. Can y'all hear me? It's, right. it's on. Right. Yes. So, so please, uh, questions for the panel? Thank you. All right, so uh, I had a question for Anquan and one for Dr. Goff. Um, so with Anquan, um, I was wondering what your thoughts were on the Colin Kaepernick situation. Also, you know, I know you guys are looking at um, pushing Roger Goodell on the activism month, what your thoughts were on that. And also the NFL PA um, situation where there's, there might be like a, a contest between the current one, Demoris Smith and, um, the guy Cyrus Mary, I know that's kind of inside baseball, but I'm a big football fan. And then Dr. Golf, I know you talked about the, um, huh? sorry, uh, I, I, know, I know you talked about the, uh, uh, the prevalence of interactions with cops early on, perhaps being a precipitating factor for some things going on later, but it seemed like this movie, you know, and it's focused on love and coffee with a cop and football and all of that, it seemed like it had seemed to be encouraging a different type of interaction. And I was wondering if you thought, you know, if you segmented it out in terms of the type of interactions that people have, negative versus positive, whether you might see a different uh, result. I'll go ahead and go first on that. Um, so it's a, it's a great question whether or not the, the kind of contact matters. Only up until a point. Um, if I get stopped, officer's polite, respects me, says I just need to talk to you. Let me go ahead and pat you down a little bit. You go on your way. That doesn't have to be the worst encounter in the world. I get stopped the next day, same thing happens. You're like, officer, why do you keep stopping me? It's like, oh, I just have to stop people going through the neighborhood. That doesn't have to be the worst encounter. The third, the fourth, the fifth, the sixth, it doesn't matter how kind and gentle it is. Right? I'm being stopped and I know why I'm being stopped. So the quality of the interaction matters much less than the content of the justice. Right? And so when people perceive that they're being stopped in ways, no matter how they're individually being treated, if the reason they're being stopped isn't just, it won't matter for the trajectory that it sets them on. Right? I wish that it could be the case. We could just have kinder and gentler racism and it would all be better. But it turns out <laughs> racism is brutal no matter how much of a smile you have on it. And that's the answer to that question. Uh, to answer your question, the whole Colin Kaepernick situation, um, how do I feel about it? Honestly, I, I, I felt like it was brilliant. And, and the reason I say that is because a year prior to Kaepernick kneeling, I lost my cousin. And no matter how many interviews, um, articles, whatever was written about it, nobody paid attention to this subject. No matter how loud I spoke, whatever I said seemed to fall on deaf ears. When Colin Kaepernick took a knee, <coughs> that's the only thing that people could talk about. Whether it's in the church, school, barbershop, restaurant, movie theaters, you name it, this conversation hasn't escaped America. And in order for us to find a solution, we have to deal with it. Unfortunately, now, more people, well, the people that don't want to deal with it, they try to talk about the kneeling part. Well, we're past that. The kneeling part was just to get your attention to talk about the real issues that we're dealing with. And I feel like that's where we are now. So as a, as a player, um, 
last year I ended up forming a coalition um, that is now up to about 40 guys in the NFL now. And I, unfortunately, you guys saw um, the memo that was sent to the NFL by us that was supposed to be um, confidential between us and the NFL. Um, so I don't know how that, well, I know how that got out. But um, that's where we are now. It's not, a, it's not about the protest. We're, we're tired of people talking about, you know, guys kneeling and disrespecting the flag or whatever. Past that, we're at the point now where we want to talk about solutions and how we can help mend those relationships between the community and police and, and also get behind legislation that should be passed in different states. It, each state looks different. You know, there's different problems in each state that we have to address. So that's where we are now. Thank you. So um, to dovetail on that, communication is, is key and supporting each other is key. So the efforts that he and his group are taking, we need to get behind that as much as we got behind him when he was on the football field. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. If we can jump up and down and, and holler and, and, you know, when, when touchdowns are scored, we better stand up and, and support this work. Um, Speaking of communication with each other, uh, I just want to give one more shout out to the, to the folks at SpokeHub. They're here. And if you download this app, SpokeHub, if you download this app, Walking While Black is in there, and you can continue the discussion with everyone here in this room. OK, so I encourage you to, to do that, because we're about uh, promoting more dialogue, more communication, more solutions, working with each other to, to, to help improve things. Miss. This question is for um, Mr. Neil Franklin. Um, I was wondering, my group is trying to work with the police department in our community and the city council to try to have the community more involved in policing, such as having an oversight committee and, and, and the hiring and firing and such things as that. We haven't been very successful, and I was wondering if you have any suggestions how we can uh, approach this sure. so that, yeah. Um, currently, there's a lot of attention on review boards, which is after the fact when something bad happens, and they haven't been very successful across the country. There have been one or two. What we're talking about here is an oversight board. And just real quick, I want to read, which is principle number two. I mean, God works in wonderful ways. I just happened to pull this up. The Peelian principles that have been around for a couple hundred years are basic policing principles from the UK that are quite relevant to today. And most of your police leaders say that they follow them. They say that they follow them. Principle number two says to recognize always that the power of the police to perform fulfill their functions and duties is dependent upon public approval of their existence, actions, and behavior, and on their ability to secure and maintain public respect. What that says is that the community, the citizens, approve of not only what the police do and sign off on it, but even their existence. Therefore, the community should have complete oversight of its police department. The budget, the hiring and firing of its leader, chief or commissioner, whatever that term is, the philosophy on how they go about their business within the community, that's where we should be moving to. There have been a couple of places around the country and in Canada have begun to move in this direction. What city are you from? Okay, College Park, Maryland. I'm very familiar with that and Greenbelt. That was where I cut my teeth as a state trooper in Maryland. I will give you my card and we will work with you on developing that in College Park. It's where we all should go, really. It's called civilian led policing, is what it is. Absolutely. So we're going to start a rapid round. Oh, please, please. So we're, we're going to do a rapid round of questions and answers now because uh, we have about 12 minutes left. 
uh, gentleman in the back there with the great suit on. That's going to be the last question. And so we'll just uh, go short questions, short answers, and we'll try to get everybody in. Sir. Reverend Mark Penman Perez, I thank you, Brother Cummings, for giving back to the community and distinguished panel before us this town meeting. I used to live on Cathedral Street protecting the South African treasures when it came to Baltimore and worked on the Post Project uh, in Camden Yards. I'm an honorary Tuskegee Airman of LA, originally from New Orleans, a national spokesman and national associated black professional firefighters, and chaplain of Lot Carey, former chaplain of Salvation Army Men's Group in North Texas. And my question is, in Dallas, Texas, 9-11 ground zero rescue worker survivor. I I love volunteering. I used to dance. I'm working with the orange shirts of gang intervention with 10,000 fearless men and fearsome women coalition. It's more hugs, no drugs. Most kids under the age of 14 have a psychological void and never been hugged. That's why it's gangs, guns, and violence. Need to be a your, second your, echelon. Your question, My please. question is, is there much interaction with working with military veterans coming back and linking with the youth and building bridges instead of blowing them up. How can we come full circle, starting locally and continue globally? I'm old school, yet I'm open to continuing with a positive solution to this ultimate conclusion. Personally, my, and my birthday is on Trayvon's thank you. birthday. Oh, thank you so much. You. Sir, I'm a military veteran and I chose to make this film. I appreciate you. So I don't know if anyone else wants to address that, but um, doing what I can, and others in the military, other folks who uh, have your interests at heart are doing what they can as well, and we're going to see to it that things get better. Sir? Should we talk about love conference or no? Should we talk about quickly about love conference? We'll wait. No? Yeah, we'll, we'll say something at the end. Okay. Okay, sir. Good afternoon. My name is Brother Cliff. I'm the Maryland State Facilitator of a Pan-African Grassroots Diaspora Organization called the Sixth Region Diaspora Caucus. First of all, Mr. Bolden, the Ravens should have dispatched a limousine full of money to keep you in Baltimore after the Super Bowl. <laughs> Second of all, <laughs> and by the way, uh, I, and my organization would be very interested in talking and working with in particular yourself, but anyone on this panel that, that is interested in helping us work out these kinds of issues with the Pan-African diaspora. My question goes to a lot of police community relations forums I've gone to. They have a tendency to go through the history of the police department, on and on and on. We don't understand why there's such a problem. It seems that they're failing to see two things. Number one, the historical context. The slave patrols, that was known long before Kaepernick's tweet. Second of all, the fraternal order of police constantly attempts to put anyone who's accused of killing a cop, even if it's trumped up charges like the Move 9, under a jail. Meanwhile, they're constantly trying to evade prosecution, evade responsibility when they gun down someone like Tamir Rice, when they choke to death someone like Eric Garner, when they killed Tyrone West in Baltimore. Your question? And Freddie Gray. My question is, number one, how can I get in touch with all these people here, in particular Mr. Bolden's group, and number two, how can we get police in these community forums to start to recognize the very issues that are causing the rift between police and the grassroots community? Thanks. I'll answer the first part. WalkingWhileBlackTheMovie.com can get you access to all the folks that we're working with. Someone else want to handle the second part? I'll, I'll talk about um, so coming out of the Community Collaboration Division, one of the things that we've been working on um, under the leadership of Chief Russell, and all of this was in motion and in place prior to the <coughs> uprising. Chief Russell is a man with vision. He is the first and only African-American male valedictorian of the Baltimore Police Department, and he's been on for 39 years. And when he received that title, that was back in 1981. So I'm gonna answer that question fairly quickly. Today, Dr. Crawley spoke and we have students from Frederick Douglass High School. Um, the first African-American police commissioner of Baltimore City is Bishop Robinson, and he's an alumni of that school. In addition, we have our students who are here that are part of the Lawn Leadership Track, and they are also a part of our Baltimore Police Explorers program, so I would just like those students to stand up real quick. And please, yes, give them a round of applause. When I talked about love, and when I talked about love starting with ourselves, that's so very true. And when it comes to law enforcement and bridging these gaps, it has to start with the training. And it has to start with getting to our youth as early as possible. Our curriculum that is in four Baltimore City High Schools right now is extremely aggressive and it is a community policing model. 
based off of a curriculum that was created <coughs> in several editions starting about 15 years ago. But it, the foundation of that curriculum is based off of Peel's nine principles of policing, which was spoken about by my colleague down here at the end. Peel's nine principles of policing starting back in 1829. Wrapping it up pretty much in a nutshell, we have to invest more in our youth and educate our youth about policing those that have a mind to go into law enforcement, to go into the legal system, because if they don't understand their rights, they don't understand how the legal system works, then we get this mess that we're in today with law enforcement. And so it goes back to the training, and it goes back to having our young people invested at an early age in policing, having more of a say-so, engaging them um, with, with the services and the different things that you can learn in the department. We focus on homegrown or young people of Baltimore as being that next pipeline into the police department where they are fully trained on community policing and not just the enforcement aspect. Can I get 30 seconds just to piggyback? Sure. I just wanted to say something. Answering your question, brother, when we talk about policing in America, that's some things that we got to understand. Policing in America is a culture. You ain't going to break into that culture. There's a culture, there's a language that they speak. When you're talking about investing money in the youth, we got to spend some money on the office. No police department in the country goes back and reinvestigate their officers once they hire out a psychological. The government is the only organization that every five years recertify their agents. An officer that's hired in 2017 will not be the same officer in 2018. And I'm just going to keep it real. Because when you get to a place in life where you've seen more years than you're going to see and you're emancipated, because they're going to pay me as long as I've lived because I've done my time so I can speak freely, having conversation with the police department at a coffee shop ain't going to be a real conversation. Because I got an answer to the people that pay my salary. Just, just like I don't even know this lady. She won't tell me the ins and outs of her household. So what I'm saying is we got to have some real conversation, real dialogue, and understand how policing in America works. Not from a theoretical standpoint, from a practical standpoint. We've got to understand that we all come to the table with some embedded racism, some embedded injustices, and until we start address, addressing the root, and I get kind of frustrated when I drive six hours on my dime and just a brand new knee, I don't have time for coffee shops. I don't have time for BS conversations because every day we're losing lives. Just like the brother was talking down here, there's a four degree separation. He's talking about his cousin, Corey. Sheila's his uncle, is his aunt. On the book tour, Surviving the Stop, we're meeting people all over America that are sharing stories with this. They want answers. They want to change the culture. The way you're going to change the atmosphere in this country, because if you don't change the atmosphere, you won't change the outcome. It ain't having conversation. It's putting pressure. When you talk about tabernacle and the football, it's a dollars and cents signs. If you really want change, cut the TV off on, on NFL Sunday. Let's put our money where our mouth is. If we're going to do this, y'all let me know so I can get back to North Carolina. And, I, and I, just, I didn't mean to come like that, but I just have a passion because I have seven black boys, single father. And after retiring, I made a promise to God, if you let me survive 30 years, of serving Caesar, I'll serve you the rest of my life in truth. So I'm gonna give you the truth because I have no repercussion of not being paid when I go back to work. I'm retired. I'm gonna give you the truth unadulterated. The truth is put pressure on the people at the top. Demand some things. You got to persevere. Just don't show up for a couple of days and go back home because when you go back home, somebody dying across the country. There are shootings taking place. We got to galvanize and be persistent about it because each profession speaks a different language. Policing speaks a different language. The clergy speaks a different language. Teachers speaks a different language. I didn't mean to be like that, but I just had to bring it like I felt it. Thank you, Bobby. Whoops, thank you. Out of respect for the people who are allowing us to use this venue, uh, distinguished panelists and distinguished guests, if you could please be very, very succinct, because we have to leave, but we want to hear what everybody has to say. So please be very succinct. 30 seconds or less. Thank so you. actually, let's do this. Just uh, the last questions, 
please ask your question very quickly and then let the, let the next person ask the question until we're to the end and then our panelists will will answer all of those and then we'll wrap up all right i guess this uh, may be more of a comment but i'll try and frame it as a question i i do agree that love is the answer but i think that in the way that uh, you're directing the love i have some problems with for example i don't see you can't, if it's unnatural to love people who abuse you, who oppress you, and who murder you. And where the love should be, and where I think we have many examples of it, is in loving our families, loving our people, loving justice enough that we refuse to put up with the police murders. Thank you, thank you. I have to ask, please, 10 second questions, please, out of respect for other people in the room. Thank you. Okay. Let's move on to the next one, please. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, blessings and peace. Uh, Brother Kimbo, you more or less stated the concern I have. I appreciate you doing the movie, but I believe with the institutionalization of racism and hatred in this country, I'm the founder of Black Love Day. I'm a breathologist. I have found we have got to find solutions that deprogram the police as well as us as a people. We can't just keep affirming love. We have to defuse all that hatred Absolutely. Do so you have that a love question? can come forth. Do you have a question? We're, we're going to have to cut off the rest of the questions if there are no questions. Good afternoon. My name is Denise Laos Cook, known as the Oracle, and my mantra is always remember to love yourself, and this means in always. I truly believe in what Ms. Twyman said earlier. When you learn to love yourself unconditionally, then you have a greater capacity for loving others. One question. Gentlemen, what do you, or and lady, what do you suggest we as a community can do I, I know what I do, but what can we as a community do to learn that self-lesson, that lesson of self-love? Oh, and my cousin Diane Watson is here. Hello, everybody. Okay, so, thank um, you. Hello, um, I, I have a question, but I'm going to introduce myself first. My name is Malachi Bridges. I just graduated from high school. I was the first ever African-American male valedictorian of my high school. Um, and I currently attend the University of Connecticut on a full ride. I'm a pre-law awesome. major, so if anyone needs an intern, let me know. Awesome. Um, we do. My, <laughs> um, my, my question is, um, even when you extend love, and I consider myself an academic scholar, I'm still negatively associated when, when it comes to the police. So how do we love in a way in which changes the narrative of African-American men? Thank you. Uh, first and foremost, I agree with the Ravens comment. Uh, I'm Derek Chase, standing for Kaepernick, all of the protests across the country, that's us, so in all our countries. In addition to that, good friend of Chief Russell's, all the stuff that happened in Baltimore, we worked hand in hand. But my question is, um, there's an organization, the International Association of Chiefs of Police. We had a conversation about the FOP. I just happen to be uh, one of the national facilitators. What are we doing to have to broaden the conversation beyond FOP but going up the chain to the International Association of Chiefs of Police. That's my question. Thank you. Okay. That's it? Okay. Oh, all right. So, any quick answers? Yeah. So, I'm a solution-based person. And I understand that a lot of people, they see me up here, and of course I work for the Baltimore Police Department. Um, in all reality, when it comes to the work that we've been doing in our division, Chief Russell has been a spearhead against the grain, okay? Um, so for example, because I'm going to speak to solutions and what we have been working on today, I spoke about one of our critical pro programs, which is the youth engagement with our explorers, training them up in a way that allows them to see what true community policing is all about. We do talk about those very tough topics such as the racist history behind policing. We also talk about the high suicide rates that law enforcement officers do experience in this line of work as well. Um, so we talk about those tough issues with the young people give them an opportunity to see the reality of this profession and allow them to gain input at a national level as to how to improve 
um, this profession for young people moving forward. So that's one. The second thing that we've instituted, and I can also speak to that personally, is the reentry program that we have. Again, we started that prior to the uprising. We have officers and we're engaged with the community, service providers, to go behind the walls and actually do referral case management. We support the returning citizen. I can speak personally to this because my father is a returned citizen as well. And so we have a dedicated team of people, again, contrary to the normal belief of what law enforcement should be doing in order to improve our communities. All of us as a team, we got tired of seeing our young people get locked up and become that direct prison pipeline. So we have been aggressively doing this work now for well over two years, uh, received our very first uh, set of funding because currently we, we have been unfunded to do the work. Um, but it's been truly a labor of love. And in the last two and a half years or so, we've been able to connect over 400 returning citizens with jobs and critical services that they need, such as housing, mental, behavioral health, um, educational services, you need it, you, you name it. So these are just some examples of solutions that law enforcement has created and come up with, especially coming out, out of our shop. And we're not, we have no intention of stopping or quitting. When we talk about that engagement and what can the community do, get behind these types of programs that, hmm. that we have because we are up against a lot of resistance from many different aspects. Thank so, you. And uh, yeah. final comment from Dr. Goff, and then we're going to um, uh, turn it over to Congressman Cummings one last time. Thank you to everybody who's still in the room. Just thank you all for staying. Give you all a hand. Thank you. There's no way I can get to every one of those, those questions, but a couple of things that people brought up. What do we do, and how do we manage love when we are hated? <clears throat> One thing to manage in a difficult relationship is accountability. I want to give you just two examples of that quickly. People have been calling for body cameras for quite some time. I'm a big believer body cameras can help with accountability. Problem with body cameras is if you don't then make sure that the data are available to other people, there's no real accountability. So body cameras in police departments, so far as our data have revealed, reduce uh, police involved use of force by about 2%. Not that much. Racial disparities, not at all. Here's the good news coming right around, right around behind that. Used to take us and all my professional nerds about nine to 12 months to write a report for every single police department we work in. We work in 300, 400 some odd police departments. Nine to 12 months to write a, 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 a report. Google has just invested in us. Google has given us engineers to automate all of that. For the 17 of y'all left in the room, let me proselytize just for a second. What that means is that nine to 12 months for every department that wants it is now nine to 12 minutes. There is no police department in the country one year from now that will be able to say, we couldn't possibly know how much of these disparities are our fault. Nine to 12 minutes to get a report powered by Google. In the departments where we're working, I'll give you just one example in Las Vegas where we run an intervention, instead of that 2% reduction from body cameras, they gave us the data, 23% reduction across the board on all use of force, and an 11% reduction in officer-related injuries. Everybody's safer when we hold ourselves accountable. I'm done. Thank you so much. Thank you to everyone here, the panel. Thank you so much. Keep in touch with us at walkingwhileblackthemovie.com. We have conferences starting October 21st that you can participate in. And uh, I want to turn it over to close us out, Congressman Cummings. Yeah. Uh Again, I want to thank uh, you, Ms. Ali, and I want to thank all of our panelists for what you have done today. Um, as I said before, and it's been said by our panelists, it's been said in the uh, film, we got to stop talking past each other and start talking to each other. Um, and I think that one of the things that I have been emphasizing everywhere I go is particularly in this time in uncertain time that we find ourselves in. I think everybody has to try to figure out how we can make things better in our own community. Somebody asked, how can we spread love? Uh, I think it was you. Um, I think we have to do things in our, our various communities. Uh, the great philosopher Voltaire said, cultivate your own garden, wherever you are. Uh, whether you sit on a board, whether you can go to a city council meeting, 
Uh, but and, and, and one of the things that we must do is we must have high expectations of government and our police officers. So many of us have gotten so used to not being treated right, we just accept it. But I'll never forget one night when I went to, and then I'll close with this. I went to Bus Boys and Poets, and one of the things that happened that night is that somebody got up and said, Mr. Cummins, he said, uh, and these were, again, these people that had just come down from Ferguson from protesting. He said, Mr. Cummins, you know, like, you know, I understand, man. You know, I understand, like, uh, you know, uh, we got to, everybody's always telling us, you know, how we got to deal with the police and how we, you know, what things we got to do. Well, when is somebody going to tell them how to deal with us? And I'll never forget that discussion, you know? This is a two-way street. And so, you know, and many of us, our experience has been with the police has been like my first experience. And I'm not knocking police because, like I said, I got police in my family. But my first experience with the police, I was six years old. And they were living in, the, in a poor neighborhood in South Baltimore. And some of you all who are a little bit older can, you know, may be familiar with what I'm about to say. The men on Saturday morning would play crap. I mean, dice in the alley. You, you, you remember? You, you know what I'm talking about? Yeah. You used to do it? OK. Uh. <laughs> and you know, they would be playing for money. Am I right? They would play for money. Little change. And my first encounter was to see the police roll up into the alley, beat up the men, take the money, don't arrest nobody, and walk away. That was my first encounter with the police. It just so happened that about a month later, the police would come into my little elementary school of nine rooms telling us they officer friendly. I mean, I'm, 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 I'm serious. I, I, I mean, so in a child's mind, there is confusion. And then, but we see things happening over and over. And one of the things that I have noticed is that, you know, when you begin to talk about these issues, if you really begin to talk about them, you begin to realize that there are a lot of people who have gone through the same thing or somebody's son or somebody's father. And it is amazing. And so we have to keep forging ahead. That's why the people in this panel are so important. They have made a decision. And I, I, the brother, I can't, the brother who just said, he stole some of my stuff, something that I say all the time. I tell young people, I tell them, I said, you know, you got something that I would give, I would pay you for. I would give my, everything but my, my wife and my children. I tell them, you got time. I tell them, if I could buy some of your time, I'd give everything but my wife and children. <coughs> And so what the folks up here are doing is they have made a decision. They have made a decision. But not only have they made a decision, but they decided to act on their decision. Their decision was is that we're going to try to create a brighter day for other people. We want them not to have to go through hell. They, 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 they took the words of Nancy Wilson in that song where she said, if I could, I would. If, you don't, if you've never heard this, the, the words of that song, you need to look it up on, on YouTube. If I could, I would. What they're trying to do is save some pain, save some lives, and make a difference. And so I want to thank all of you for being here. It means a lot to me. We've got to keep this conversation going. There are others who will say, Cummings, what difference does it make? Well, well my staff will tell you, I don't do anything unless I can get a result. No, but I'm looking for results. And I'm looking of ways to be effective and efficient. But panelists, let me tell you something. You have caused somebody in this audience or somebodies to go back to their communities and work harder. And there are things that you have said that will ring in their minds as they sit in that city council meeting, as they insist that the mayor have a strong police accountability board. Ali, they will look at this film 
and realize that, you know, this ain't no joke. It's not just happening in one place, it's happening all over the place. And so, again, I want to thank all of you. First of all, I want to thank you all for staying. Amen. Thank you for staying. And give our panelists another hand, please. And don't forget, and don't forget, Brother Ali, Ali, I just want to make sure that we get this film seen by as many people as possible. I'm going to let you close out to tell them. I just want to make sure that film gets out to Lottie, Dottie, and everybody. How can we help you make that happen? Go ahead. Thank you. Thank you again. So we do need your help. We're independent filmmakers. We've given up everything for this except for our families. Um, Go to walkingwildblackthemovie.com, uh, you know, share it with your friends, talk about it on social media. We need funding, we need sponsors, uh, we need investors, we need anyone that can help us move it out there so that millions of people around the country can see this film. So we're not Paramount, we're not Lionsgate, we're Errol Weber and A.J. Ali, and we put every dime we've got had into this film and every <laughs> ounce of energy and, into this thing. And so we did it for you. And please, please support it because we're dealing with things like the NAACP Image Awards is interested in this film, but we can't afford the, the few thousand dollars to do a seven-day screening of it in theaters so we can even qualify for a nomination, you know? Thank God I have my sister here so I could stay at her house and Errol stayed in the basement. Otherwise, we'd have been finding the corner somewhere in the convention center to sleep in. So we really need your help. And I promise you, we'll give it 110% for the rest of our lives if you give us that support. Thank you and God bless you. We had a GoFundMe page that actually paid for the production of the, of the film, but now we need to keep it going with promotions. So. Thank you so much. Please come talk with us, and God bless you. Love each other. Love each other. <laughs>